Everybody loves nature, majestic mountains, pristine streams, vast oceans, and a million other wonders. Love it though we may, we were once much closer to nature. When this country was mainly rural, it was easier to see how people were an integral, inseparable part of the natural world, one element of the planet's vast, complex ecosystem. Now, North America's population is overwhelmingly urban, and living in a largely man-made landscape, we lose sight of the natural world and lose sight of our place in it. We're all still part of that natural system, no matter how remote and abstract it may sometimes seem. And nature's limitless vastness will sustain us and our growth through countless generations as we continue to hold dominion over it and exploit it as we were meant to do. You can see how we got into this current situation. All those ideas, limitless resources, infinite growth, the belief that human beings had not only a right but a responsibility to exploit nature were drilled into us pretty thoroughly for most of the 20th century. It seemed like a plausible course of action, too. There were only a couple or three billion of us on the planet, after all. It's such a big planet that helped to make it easy to ignore consequences or assume that, if there were any, their impact would be minimal or negligible. But watch the news or read the papers, and there's another story about consequences every day. The number of humans has more than doubled in four decades. There are about six and a half billion of us on the planet now. And the Earth's population is not shrinking. And the growth rate of that population is not slowing down. We we all contributed to the current situation. We can contribute just as effectively to the solution. Simple, easy changes and choices can have a significant, lasting, positive, and much needed impact. It's another one of the things all humans can share, in addition to what we already have in common that David Suzuki is about to explore and explain. Humankind first appeared about 200,000 years ago along the Rift Valley of Africa. We had no special strength, speed, or senses, but we did have an enormous brain, wellspring of curiosity, inventiveness, and a prodigious memory. As life moved around them, our distant ancestors recognized patterns, watched seasons come and go, understood animal migrations, plant succession, storing knowledge crucial to survival. For 99% of our existence, we lived in small family groups, embedded in a world in which everything was inextricably linked to everything else. In such a world, any action has consequences. Every deliberate act entails responsibility. Okay. We passed on this understanding in songs, dances, and stories. They told of our place in the universe, our obligation to maintain the abundance around us. It's a way of life many groups today are struggling to retain. Just a few hundred years ago, we learned a new way of seeing. It was called experimental science. We conceived of the world as a kind of machine, a clockwork mechanism that we could understand by taking it apart and examining it piece by piece. It's been a powerful way of knowing, taking us into the heart of life and matter and out beyond the solar system.
science and technology, we have transformed the world around us and our own lives. Around the world, cities are now our principal dwelling places. Economies search the globe for raw materials and markets, spreading a dazzling promise of limitless consumption. Ancient world views lose their power and die. We've lost our sense of interconnectedness, broken the link with ancestors and generations to come, forgotten what keeps us alive. Have a new responsibility, making sure we don't deprive future generations of what we have taken for granted. We have to define what our survival and well-being depend on, the real bottom line. Climate experts are almost certain that this will be the hottest year the northern constants are so low that the federal there government is finally agreeing that the common weed killer 2,4-D causes... Environmentalists and many scientists say if we don't cut carbon dioxide emissions from the cars hole in the ozone layer... Come on, let's go. We need to look again and see an Earth that is alive. the earth as a living entity, I think, recognizes its self-regulating, its emergent nature. It's not just a collection of rocks and uh, atmospheric gases and water and organisms. It's much more than that. It's an entity in, in its own right. And I think looking at things in that sense is a very necessary step in, uh, in our culture. From space, we look back and see the truth. Every time the sun comes up and down, and for us going around the Earth once every hour and a half is 16 times a day. And every time you see it very well, that thin, thin, thin layer just above the surface, and we're way above that thin layer. And that's the atmosphere of the Earth. That is it. A few tens or dozen kilometers. That is it. Below that is life, and above that is nothing. It's vacuum. From the Australian outback to the British Columbian coast, indigenous people around the world provide a different perspective of our place on the planet. They speak of the Earth as our mother. They say everything is made from four sacred elements, Earth, air, fire, and water. are made from those sacred elements. As biological beings, we're dependent